Many, many years ago in Africa, when you go to the market, you don't carry a cart. You carry what they call nylon bags. So that's enough 50 pounds of weight lifting. Hallelujah. But here in Africa, in America, you push the carts. You even have some carts that have, you know, tires that if you want to sit and drive through the aisle, there's so much comfort. And at the end of the day, a lot of lifestyle diseases have crept in unknowingly. And then a lot of people begin to blame God when certain symptoms start to show. Especially when you cross over into your 30s and 40s, your metabolism starts to slow down. So there are certain things you need to do to make sure that you are in charge and on top of your health. Hallelujah. By the special grace of God this morning, we have health practitioners in the house that are going to be ministering to us. They are not just going to be teaching. They are going to be ministering because they are believers and they are children of God. And God has blessed us with people who are knowledgeable about these things. The first speaker this morning is going to be Dr. Tunde Komolafe. Please put your hands together for Jesus. Hallelujah. He's going to be talking about heart health. Please come forward, sir. He's going to be talking about heart health. He's a cardiologist of no mean repute. And as you can see, he's ready for us. Let's put our hands together once again. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise Jesus. Hallelujah. Thanks for, good morning. Uh, thanks for having me here today. Um, I want to say thank you to the pastors for giving me the opportunity to come and talk to God's people in the house. And I'm an interventional cardiologist to do like heart attacks, pacemaker stents. If you have any, anything with the, uh, with the heart, basically. I want to start off with 1 Timothy 4.8. If we just quickly, if you can turn our Bibles there. Just something about bodily exercise. I'll, I'll read real quick. Bible says, for bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is pro profitable for all things. And has the promise of the life that now is and that which is to come. So even the Bible definitely knows that we need to exercise because this, this is God's vessel. And we need to take care of it. I have about 10 points. I'll, talk, I'll, I'll go over it. And if you have any questions afterwards, then you can ask questions or uh, I'll be around after the service. So I'll go I'll do a quick introduction. Then I'll talk about high blood pressure, which is one of the most common ailments I see in the clinic. Now I'll talk a little bit about diabetes, um, then congestive heart failure. That's one of the other common things I see people in the clinic. Then about heart attacks, strokes, cancer. And there are some basic screening things we need to do to prevent, once, once you get older, to prevent you from having some of these chronic illness. So I'll talk a little bit about it. Then obviously about lifestyle modifications, how to change our lifestyle, and I'll take questions. So what's high blood pressure? I'm sure everybody here has heard about high blood pressure. Basically, it's when the pressure in your vessels are too high. If it's too low, it's bad. If it's too high, it's bad. So the way I describe my patients is, um, if like a, like a hose, a water hose outside. If the pressure is too high, you can see how hard it is, and it can actually cause damage to your brain over time, your heart, your, your kidneys, and all. But if the pressure is low, then you have no energy. The, the water hose is just very floppy. So it's too low is bad, too, um, too low is bad, too high is bad. What's a good blood pressure? Um, 140 over 90. So if your top number is 140 and above, then you need to start worrying about that. Uh, your bottom number should be 90 or less. So 140 over 90. If you're diabetic, we try to bring it down a little bit lower, like to like 120s. But uh, anybody just check your blood pressure in the past in the past month? Okay, okay. So we have a lot of compliant people in the house today. So if you go to Kroger, you go anywhere, you can easily check your blood pressure. So why is high blood pressure bad? It can it can it can, it, can, it, it causes strokes, um, heart attacks. It's one of the leading causes of of kidney failure in um, in America. So young, you might think you're young, in your 30s. Some people they come. By the time they come to the hospital, they already have end-stage liver and um, kidney disease, so they have to be on dialysis. So don't say you're young, that it can never happen, because we see it a lot. And once you could be in your 30s and have real bad blood pressure, and your kidneys are all, all, all shut down. Then diabetes. Then I'm going to have an idea what, the, I know we all think in Nigeria that it's just too much sugar. So anybody has an idea what diabetes is all about? Any, yeah, what, you, what, what, what's the idea about what diabetes is? Let's, let's make, it, uh, make it interactive. Yeah, diabetes is uh, when somebody has a high sugar in his body, in his, in his uh, blood. Okay, that's, 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 that's true. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. 
Diabetes is when your pancreas uh, does not secrete enough uh, insulin to to work in your system. Okay, that's 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 a more technical answer. So we we have we have two types. He's very he's very correct. There's type one diabetes, which most people don't have. That means there's some beta cells in your pancreas that secrete insulin, and insulin helps to break down um, glucose into the body and uh, for the food we eat. So your pancreas doesn't make enough insulin. They're born that way. They need to be on insulin for life. Most people, however, they are overweight, they're obese, so their body produces insulin, but it's not enough. Or you have too much adipose tissue, and the insulin cannot work effectively on fat cells. Insulin works on skeletal, skeletal muscle, so the more lean, um, um, body, lean body weight you have, the better. But once you have a lot of fat, even though the insulin is circulating in your body, on fat tissue cells, it doesn't work well. So that's, that's type 2 diabetes. Sometimes you can get pump pills to make your body produce more insulin, or you have to be on insulin yourself. But definitely, in America, type 2 diabetes is the most common form of, um, diabe of, uh, of diabetes. So heart failure, there's something called congestive heart failure. It's not what everybody thinks like your heart just fails, yes, but there are two main types. One, your a normal heart functions about 60%, what we call the ejection fraction. But a lot of people, their heart gets so weak, and how do you know your heart is weak? Your legs get swollen, you walk from here to the bathroom, you're very short of breath, you're trying to lay. So if you have any of these symptoms, you probably need to um, see a doctor. Um, you lay flat on your bed at night, and you just can't, you can't breathe because there's a lot of congestion in your lungs. So you wake up at night gasping for breath. That's one of them. Or your legs are swollen, or you have some kind of chest tightness or chest pain. I know those symptoms, you need to see, you, you need to see a doctor. You'd be, you, you'd be surprised how many people have symptoms, but it does not should go to a doctor. And men are the most, uh, they are definitely, I don't know why we men, we just take everything, take our bodies for granted. They think, some say they think they have gas or something. They've been having chest pain for weeks and months, but the mothers, the wives, they force them to come, and then we see that they have a lot of um, bad trouble. So then, but the earlier you come, the better, because if you wait too long, even with the best of medical care, sometimes it might be a little bit too late. So heart attacks. Um, I'm sure we all know what heart, heart attacks are. You have a blockage in your arteries. You're having chest pain. Um, in this country, because we have the facilities, if I'm on call within 30 minutes, I have to be in the hospital. We can actually go in put a wire down there, get a stent there, and, and relieve the blockage. But most people don't have to wait till it gets that bad. Uh, and my wife, my wife knows for the past five years, that two o'clock in the morning call is never fun because, you know, there's somebody, the ER calls you and you have to show up within like 30 minutes. So how can we prevent it? Taking care of your blood pressure, don't smoke cigarettes, make, it, make sure your sugars are good, and that's basically how you prevent heart attacks. So two major things that I just wanted to... Um want us to remember out of all he has said, if you ever find yourself in such a situation where somebody is having a heart, you know, like a, a racing heart, like he said, he said the vagal maneuver. If for any reason, you know, there are two basic things you can do at that point. Like he said, if you bear down, you know when you are trying to poop and it's very hard? Yes, that's what he means when he says bear down. Bear down means to act like you are trying to push. Amen? Amen. So if you ever find somebody in that kind of condition that their heart is racing very fast, please tell them to try and push down. Amen? Or you can do the vagal maneuver, that he, uh, the carotid maneuver. Amen? So just put your hands like right here and just massage it for like one minute. Because I'm telling you, a lot of people don't even know how to do correct CPR. If you find somebody in an emergency situation having a heart attack, how many people here know how to do CPR? Amen. Every one of us should know how to do CPR. At least. You never can tell where you will need this knowledge. It's good to be proactive. Now, what we are trying to do is to give us information to make us proactive. Amen. Amen. Let's put our hands together once again for Dr. T. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, the second person who is going to speak to us is another Dr. K. Okay, so this is Dr. Kola, Dr. Kamala Fe, and this is Dr. Kola Wale. Dr. Kola Wale is another doctor of no mean repute. He has an extensive background in quality assurance and quality management. Now, I call him doctor of doctors because they are the ones that manage 
doctors. Amen. Now, the reason why I say that is because most times if you go to the hospital, when they're talking about quality improvement, they are trying to make sure that patients have good outcomes. So if there is a problem, you know, with a particular clinic, they try to fix that problem. If they work with health organizations like the United Nations, Let's NGOs. Let's put our hands together for Jesus as we welcome Dr. Kolawale. Amen. Thank you very much, Ma. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, I will not take this privilege for granted. Uh, first to God, because in, in the few years of my life, I've seen a lot happen which does not follow the normal medical rule. I've had colleagues who are dead. So I would say they didn't lack knowledge. So passing or extending knowledge across is not only it. There's also a God that rules in the affairs of men. So uh, well, basically my core agenda is a patient, a patient right and access to care, which is a subset of quality health care. Quality health care itself is a subset of um, public health. And of course, uh, I just remember that I saw an Hippocratic that I should give respect to my senior colleague. Dr. T, thank you for the excellent job. <laughs> And I think he has made my job very easy. So, health as defined by WHO uh, is a state of complete physical, mental, social well-being. And not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Uh, of course, we need to first be sure we understand what health means. Complete state of physical, mental, and um, social well-being. Now, you could see something in red. Ability to lead a social, economically productive life. Which is actually the core of the reason why we all want to be healthy. I want to be able to go to work and make money. I want to be able to relate and come to Evangelist Dennis' birthday. I want to be socially healthy. I want to be able to relate with the community. And I also want to see street lights turning red and slow down in my car. That means I'm socially healthy. I don't want to break lights. I don't want to disobey the rules. I want to be politically smart and legally fine. So health transcends beyond just uh, being waking up and being fine. You must also be able to lead a socially and economically productive life. And that's why you get more sick, where you see in, uh, professionals, intelligent people, sick in the hospital and not, and having some relapsing and remitting period where they are not really able to give in their best to the system where they belong. It's, it's so painful. Here, yeah, uh, different aspects of life have different definitions to health. But for a patient that walks into an hospital system, basically what you're interested in is the first thing that ailment should go. If there is pain, you want it to be off, isn't it? If something is making you weak, you want it to be gone. That is the basic definition from the patient's perspective. But from, you, you also need to understand that the hospital has its own perspective of health too for you. The hospital wants... A, a, a smart place where technically efficient. They want to be sure that is, they, they are using the most updated equipment, updated and maybe research proven method of treating you. So there's going to be a conflict between what you think is going to lead you to health and what the hospital thinks may lead you to health. You should also understand that the health manager also have their own view. They have to manage the cost of running the hospital which are all the things that has to be put in place to make sure you come out LD, which is also a function of when you present yourself to the hospital, or at least when you call for help, which is why when Dr. T was saying it, it is better for it to be called early. Promptness is very good. And he mentioned something that struck me, which I think I didn't even pay attention to. Men tend to form like superheroes. We really don't want to come down to the hospital easily. But we have a way of forcing our wives to go to the hospital or make them go as early as possible. And maybe that's why more women... <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, but, but, but come to think of it. So, basically, across all spectrum, everybody have their own different definitions of quality improvement based on their training and based on what they've been doing. So, this should help us in our view of the hospital. And that's why I, from the next slide, I came out with some terms that I think it, it should be clear to us. 
now because when, when we understand those terms and when they say it in a clinical setting or when you're being counseled you would quickly understand what it means so we have uh, next slide we have uh, acute chronic and uh, sometimes subacute and then acute and chronic diseases when they say something is acute maybe i should ask someone who knows who, who can say when something is an acute illness what, what what comes to your mind straight severe Something that needs immediate attention. Something that needs what? Immediate attention. So when they say something is chronic, what does it mean? So you think chronic is worse than acute, right? Thank you, God bless you. Acute is actually worse than chronic. Acute can get you down and kill you instantly. That's the meaning. Chronic means it's been on you for more than 21 days. So it's really not something that should kill you urgently again. But there could also be acute and chronic, which the person naturally has had maybe diabetes for a while. So there could be an acute infection on the chronic DM because the DM is likely have a chance to weaken the immune system. So there could be an acute and chronic scenario. There could also be subacute because I just said 21 days. I think subacute is between 3 and 21 days. So acute might mean urgent. Like chest pain of unknown origin, it's so, it's, it's like some would say, it's hooking me. <laughs> I think that's a common funny term that people use. But a sudden onset of chest pain that you can't explain, and it's, it's, it's an acute thing, it's an emergency. You need to get to the ER as fast as possible. Yeah, so we, we need to understand that. We also have the preventive medicine, the curative medicine, and the rehabilitative medicine. When they're trying to tell us, please make sure you're regular on your drugs as an hypertensive, uh, as a diabetic, and everything, they're trying to prevent further complications. And it is better. Prevention is better than cure. Curatively, is always more expensive to cure. More expensive does not mean cost of money. More expensive might mean even the cost of one's life. The cost of losing an organ the kidney, having to need a transplant, having to need something. It's always safer to act in the form of prevention, to take meds regularly as advice. I want to talk more on depression, but I still have somebody else who's coming in and uh, talk on depression as well. But the side of depression is going to talk on is going to be uh, postpartum depression. Postpartum depression is most of the time depression after a childbirth. That is postpartum depression. So I'm not going to go there because somebody else is <clears throat> coming there. So what is depression? Depression is majorly, slide one. Depression is majorly feeling sad. What is the difference between sadness and uh, depression? When any bad occurrence happens, everybody gets sad sadness but sadness should be temporary you should heal out of sadness but when something happens and your sadness persists you can not come out of the sadness then it's tending to depression um, schizophrenia is another big one and uh, when you talk about schizophrenia um, most of the time, you are hallucinating. You are seeing ghosts, not the ghost back home. You are seeing what is not, other people cannot see. You are hearing voices. When you hear voices that no one around you can hear, then you are hallucinating. So when, when you see all these symptoms, try to talk to somebody. Try to seek help. Um, back home, we don't, most of the time we don't believe in, uh, we don't believe in depression. We believe we are too strong than depression. But nobody is ever too strong than depression. If you are having some symptoms of depression, something is making you keep you down low there, look for help. Talk to somebody. Somebody you can confide in. If that person is not the right person, Sometimes to talk to your pastor. What is bothering you? And uh, if you need to see a doctor, please.
talk to a doctor. Um, it's an opportunity to stand here to talk to you all about mental health. Just like the speaker who just you know, introduced mental health, one of the organs in the body which is very complex is the brain. The brain has billions of cells called neurons that interact and it helps us to interpret information, get it right, and function well. So there is no doubt, if you think about the brain, just the brain, how those billions of cells are all correlated together to make us function as proper beings, then you agree with me that there is an almighty. Because these neurons, if anything goes short somewhere, then we have the response, which manifests itself in our day-to-day -day, um, lives, like the problems, Brian McKenzie just said, like depression. So um, for brevity, we just, I'm just going to talk about the very first thing here about mental health. You need to diagnose mental health. That's a problem that we have, because there's no standardized thirst. It becomes kind of senile, like blood pressure. Blood pressure is there. You may never know you have blood pressure until you test yourself and find your blood pressure is up. And then they say, wow, you are a walking bomb. But with mental health, you, there is no standardized test that you go and do a blood work and they tell you you have a problem and that's a problem. So it can stay for a long time. And because of the stigma that we cannot emphasize more, it goes on diagnose mental health. So we have to diagnose it. We have to give it a name. If you don't give it a name and know what to call it, then how do you go about treating it? So we have to give it a name. And once you get it diagnosed, then you will know exactly what is wrong with you. Um, I just want to lay a little bit of emphasis about postpartum depression, simply because we have a young congregation. And I think you all bear with me that the procreation rate here is quite high. So we may have some ladies here who may be going through that and we will never know. Statistics does show one out of seven women will suffer postpartum depression. So if we count the number of ladies here, say there are seven ladies here and one of them is suffering from postpartum depression, that's a sign of concern that we all need to do something about it. So um, for the sake of brevity, as I said, um, why do I choose postpartum depression? Just for the reasons that I've explained. And um, normally after childbirth, there should be some amount of joy and happiness. Women you know, go through a lot of hormonal changes, but sometimes those hormonal changes can take them to places where they themselves, they don't know and they begin to feel a type. Some people will cry. This is the postpartum blues, which is normal for them to cry. It only lasts for so long, for say one, one week. But if that postpartum blues goes past one week, and then we get that problem of postpartum depression. There are so many causes of postpartum depression. And they begin to feel like they are responsible for what is happening to them. But little do they know is their brain that may be playing, I'll use this word, may be playing a trick on them. It's the brain. Because you can't understand what is going in there. There's so much happening in your brain. Your brain interprets and sends information to other areas in that same brain to tell you exactly what is happening. But if there are hormonal changes which enable the brain to function properly, then there is some disarray of information there so you can't really get it. So we cannot emphasize more on postpartum depression. It is senile, it can take women to places they don't know. And we just have to let the husbands know. Um, sometimes I used to say my greatest wish would be to be pregnant. So I can understand because we don't know. A woman will tell you what she's going on and sometimes we take it for granted or we just put it under the rug. You know, she gets, you know, pregnant, she brings the child forth and she begins to act funny in the house. She gets irritated for little things. We can't understand why. She cries sometimes. She's so withdrawn. Her mood is low. 
I mean, you know, um, activities such as sexual activities is down. All is what is going on in our brain, which little does she know exactly what is going in her brain. So it's something very important that we have to understand. Sometimes our women, what they go through, and then we have to talk. We have to talk. There is just no other way in mental health other than talking, psychotherapy. You talk and you empower people. People may be feeling low, but if you get to counseling, they will do more talking. And then they can give you some mood stabilizers, some antidepressants, just to keep you fine. But the major part of it is that talking aspect of it. So we should refrain from thinking, uh, somebody's going to judge me and think I'm crazy. No, talk. Just like Brother Mackenzie said, talk to people. There are lots of helps out there. Even in hospital for um, newborn um, mothers, there's help out there ready for you. If you have any problems, talk to someone.